Let me take out the music, Doug. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, presentation this evening. My name is Neil Vandry. I'm your officiator here at the Church of Perpetual Life. I'm so glad to see you all come tonight. We've got a wonderful presentation, one by, uh, we have two speakers this evening. Now, we have presentations typically every month, and uh, next month we'll be having Jim Stroll and Bernadine coming to speak from People Unlimited. I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, tonight, I'd like to get right into the program as we have these two marvelous speakers. Our first speaker this evening is a gentleman who many of you have met, uh, who speaks here often, uh, Mr. Bill Falloon. He's compiled a 1,500-page medical book, uh, Disease Prevention and Treatment, and he has a latest book, of Pharmacracy, How uh, Corrupt Deals and Misguided Medical Regulations Are Bankrupting America and What to Do About It. He's also the director and co-founder of Life Extension Foundation. He's been featured in hundreds of media appearances, including the Phil Donahue Show, Joan Rivers, Tony Brown's Journal, ABC News Day One, and Newsweek Magazine. So let's all give a welcome to Mr. Bill Falloon. Neil, thank you so much. It is an incredible privilege to be standing here tonight before this congregation. The reason I say it's a privilege is that never before in medical history has anyone been able to put on a credible scientific presentation describing a human clinical study whose primary endpoint is meaningful and systemic age reversal. We are seeking to reverse the aging process in elderly humans. We define elderly as being over 55 years of age and dem demonstrating some clinical sign of senescence. This study is going to occur in South Florida. We're going to enroll 30 to 50 older individuals, and we're going to take blood from younger individuals, average age of 21. We're gonna mobilize those individuals ahead of time so that they have lots of stem cells flowing through their bodies. And we're gonna pull out those stem cells and plasma components and put those into the older people. The objective being a reversal of the aging process. Doing You may ask relevant able in the science past able to eradicate small part an area wide population or they eat virus think they were able to eradicate years was the or around the world did. That's a spe spectacular scientific achievement. What we're doing with the stem cell mobilized young blood components of younger people, putting it into older people, is we're seeking to clinically reverse their aging process. Well, if we do it, we may not know which was the. If we take old So that's so that we today. The premise that we is energy called by you're going to get more over the next years. Research in area universal technology universities in the but the word, and then the Greek is a long word. We only have a few parables. They share the response to that. Do that. People would practical and human systems called grand. Relating fact, mobile the stem cell can over period 
with reason and remove that we to the old of the arriving rejuvenation right mouse is by the way done for particular one longevity they were able and effect an equivalent of now potential danger for you in an extra years technology today enable it for a very time uh, looks Ray Kurzweil. If we can expand ourselves to technologies, so you see there, nine two lay between two and just not all, over the last three years, a number of were done. Aging. Scientifically found is that parabiosis rejuvenates virtually every organ system in an old animal. That young blood is facilitating an age reversal effect. And what I'm doing here is just taking some quotes out of this Nature article, because you can see this was published just a few months ago, January 21st, 2015. This is how new this technology is to the younger scientists who have studied the work that people did in the 1960s and 1970s, but they're basically copying it and they're improving it. So they're seeing rejuvenation of the heart, the brain, the muscle, the liver. Nothing goes wrong with it. Giving very in reverse human age was medical science CPR in the late 1800s stopped for all they stopped and didn't. Goes unfortunately up what of this beautiful of study. This the question is this going to be a little bit more because factors that would. Even a tissue mechanism might find an added to but as we get older, themselves produce the they to keep us turn themselves or turn back. And we see consistent across the board. In particular slide, the different research doing parabiotic research. We see Brigham and Young's work. We see Harvard. We see Stanford. these are the most famous universities in the world. The kind of research related in the arena. That we start as animal in the laboratory. Now, I'm protein in blood. 11. French factors that may on cells in old used. Into all kind of wonderful things that 
expected aging have lots of circulating old people so study that we're going to take but in hope lots of of an routines to restore that five in America they suffer with heart five minutes and can the of it normally will disorder biosis and if that's all just did itself huge research aimed at aging into an older animal, their hearts get better. Just that one fact alone could ignite the interest that we need to see age reversal research become a reality. So in 1915, or 2015, lots and lots of favorable research showing how young blood rejuvenates older animals. And it does it again in multi-organ systems. If all it did is rejuvenate a few organs, that would be good, it would be a breakthrough, but it wouldn't accomplish what this church wants to accomplish, and that is the attainment of physical immortality. This is that stepping stone we feel towards giving us that extra 10 to 12 years or more of healthy lifespan so that we don't suffer the debilities of aging and that we can live longer than what we may be programmed to do already. So a novel human clinical study. I cannot tell you how much effort goes into designing studies, putting all the pieces together. I've been working on it for over a year. A number of other people have been contributing their intellect and their efforts to making this a reality. We plan to do it in South Florida. We think some people will fly in from around the world to participate. Uh, one of the big challenges is, re is recruiting young donors. We'll be paying those young donors a lot of money, but still it it's sometimes challenging to get those young donors. Now, even modest success of this study, if we just get a 10 to 30 percent reversal in the aging process, it will spare Medicare from potential insolvency. In other words, old people won't need all this medical care anymore because they're going to be younger. They won't require all of this medicine. And of course, what we're all looking for is adding decades of healthy lifespan. If parabiosis gives us 10 or 12 years of additional lifespan and some other technology improves, well, we may just walk up a set of stairs towards immortality. So this research is the only one that I know of today that can be applicable to elderly humans, and it's available, we hope, in South Florida based on how we're working. The brain is the area that all of us notice as we age past 30 to 40. We don't remember as well. And the reason we don't remember as well, there's a lot of structural problems that occur with the aging brain. Uh, and that's seen very clearly with an electron microscope. Uh, e even an MRI can pick up all kinds of deficiencies in older brains. Parabiosis reverses systemic brain aging. Many of the factors involved in brain aging are reversed by parabiosis. Muscle loss, sarcopenia is a technical, technical term for that. And it's what induces frailty in so many older people. They don't even have the strength in their muscles to perform the way they need to just to deal with daily activities. Well, GDF-11 through parabiosis, it restores muscle mass. And that would theoretically then improve insulin sensitivity. And that would, in, in, in fact, improve lifespan rather greatly. So we have valid, documented, evidence right now through a multitude of animal studies. If this were only done once or twice, we'd really question, is it really going to work? But you can see all these slides are referenced. These are mostly different studies, but they all uncover the same information. Young blood, when transfused into older animals, induces systemic age reversal benefits, including that critical microglial area of the brain. A lot of people aren't aware of that, but that's an area that deteriorates that creates a lot of the dementia people suffer. But we're seeing the consistency. Our blood vessels, our endothelium, as we get older, it's our Achilles tendon, stroke, heart attack, kidney failure. That's often a result of endothelial dysfunction. Parabiosis rejuvenates the blood vessels. It doubles the perfusion into the brain. 
And that's a huge problem with aging people. They just don't have the amount of blood circulating in their brain that they did when they were older. Puts them at risk for stroke, for Alzheimer's, for all kind of neurodegenerative illnesses. Well, parabiosis corrects that. So this is where we're getting really excited. Now, one year ago, the Harvard Gazette uh, published the results of what Harvard people were doing with their research. And they're consistently seeing that you put the proteins from young animals into older animals, and they become younger. And these are just some excerpts from the Harvard Gazette, where they're seeing the consistency of failing hearts, uh, the brains, the skeletal mu muscles. They're seeing consistent age reversal merely by putting young animal blood into old animals. And again, we can't do that with humans. This has got to be a very sophisticated technique if we're going to induce the age reversal without inducing side effects. But the fact is, they're seeing it in consistent studies with animals. So the fact that we know it works in animals means we've got to translate that into humans. And this is what we plan to do. Now, Dr. Jarvik uh, is a biochemist at Carnegie Mellon. His brother is the famous uh, Jarvik heart, uh, artificial heart inventor. Uh, this is not that Dr. Jarvik, but he wants to do parabiosis research in pets. And I've had a number of conversations with him. He feels very confident that he can do it. And he thinks some people will like their pets more than their relatives and they might sign their pets up to have this done. So uh, that's where he's working, out of Pittsburgh. Uh, but again, I mentioned Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge. There's numbers of universities that are all doing the same thing. They all want to see age reversal occur. But maybe the most impressive slide I show tonight will be the fact that Johnson & Johnson, the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, they've just put $50 million into a study at Stanford where they're going to try parabiosis research in human beings. They are looking to reverse Alzheimer's disease using GDF-11 and other proteins from young donors. That study is going to take a long time. J&J's motivation is to patent a synthetic drug based on what they pull out of the young donors. And my concern is they may take 10 years to make that happen. A lot of people in this room don't have 10 years left to live. And at some point, none of us will have 10 years to, to live. So we want to do a study uh, that will enable us to apply the systemic benefits of parabiosis technology to the entire body so that we can enjoy that systemic rejuvenation effect. But the fact that Johnson & Johnson put in $50 million, which is not a lot of money to them, but it's still significant, they feel this has the potential to reverse at least neurologic aging and perhaps Alzheimer's. So it's an interesting analogy for for us to believe that this has some reality to it. So what are we going to do? Uh, we have designed a clinical study. We're going to take 30 to 50 elderly people, and elderly can be over 55 if you've got some medical problems, and we're going to then recruit tissue type match younger donors, average age of about 21. We're going to shoot them up with this drug granulocyte colony stimulating factor. And that's exactly what it does. It stimulates the colonies in the bone marrow to produce lots of immune cells and stem cells, and more importantly, these youth proteins. We're gonna carefully separate that blood. We're gonna cryopreserve the stem cells, by the way. We are not going to put young stem cells into older people. The reason being, we risk something called graft versus host disease, which is a horrific condition. It strikes about 40% of leukemia patients who undergo stem cell transplants. Uh, they get cured of the leukemia, and then the graft versus host disease kills them. It causes an autoimmune reaction to the entire body, and that kills the, the older person or the leukemia patient. So we're only going to take the proteins from the young plasma and put that into the older people. So the study is being designed. I'll keep you updated through future uh, services we put on at the church include this presentation, we get back to smallpox, and you look at how long it took for mankind to develop the technology that resulted in the eradication of smallpox. Uh, it was first described in, in, in writing uh, 1200 BC in Egypt, it may have been described earlier in China, um, and it, it took all the way till 1796 AD 
for the vaccine to be validated. Now, by the way, lots of people before Edward Jenner had come up with inoculations using live smallpox viruses or even vaccines using cowpox. But that technology wasn't carried forward. They, they, they saved people and then the doctor may have died and the technology got lost. That happened with parabiosis. It's 1972, 73, it fell off a cliff and it's being revived. We can't let this go. We've got to make this parabiosis research doable. We've got to make it because technology that So the bottom line is we're going to cure biological aging at some point. The question is, can any of us really afford to wait? And that is the conclusion of my presentation. And um, Max Moore or Neil? That's a, uh, an overview of, of the process, and I'd like to bring up now our next speaker. Our next speaker this evening is the CEO of the world's largest cryonic provider, Alcor. His name is Dr. Max Moore, has degrees in philosophy, politics, economics. He's the founder of the Ex Extropy Institute and has written many articles on the transhumanism uh, movement, on, on transhumanism, and these are in, uh, publications throughout the world. He has TV and video appearances, which include Crossfire, The Learning Channel, and The Discovery Channel, documentaries in France, Switzerland, Spain, the Netherlands, Russia, and then the Sea Mysteries and the Millennium, several appearances, appearances on the breakthroughs, a transcentury update cable TV show, the documentaries New Edge and the theatrical release Synthetic Pleasures and many other television and radio shows. He's also appeared in two novels, but he continues to insist that he is a real person. Marvin Minsky, the father of artificial intelligence, said of Dr. Moore, we have a dreadful shortage of people who know so much, can both think so boldly and clearly, and can express themselves so articulately. Carl Sagan was another such one, and, partly by paying the price of his life, managed to capture the public eye. But Sagan is gone and has not been replaced. Marvin Minsky says, I see Max as my candidate for, the po for that post. Ray Kurzweil, Earth author, inventor, and winner of the Presidential Medal of Innovation in Technology said, Max Moore's ideas are very influential. Among other big thinkers, who in turn are influenced leaders themselves. Max's writings represent well-grounded science futurism and reflect a sophisticated understanding of technological trends and how these trends are likely to develop during this coming century. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Max Moore. Thank you, Neil. That's such a good introduction, I should just quit now while I'm ahead. Gosh. Okay, so I don't know how many people here know a lot about cryonics, a little bit. If you think you know a fair bit, could you put your hands up so I can get some sense? Okay, so we're about half of the people. And then of those watching, I have no idea. So I'm going to cover some of the basics, so those of you who are already familiar with them, please be patient. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, it depends on what you're interested in, so I'll take a lot of questions. I don't want to stand here and talk for a long period of time. I want to stop and see what you want to know more about. The first thing to say about cryonics, that's actually a pretty good uh, overview that Dr. Oz gave, by the way. He seemed to, it wasn't quite accurate. It kind of skipped a few steps, but it was not bad. Um, I want to, first of all, give a conceptual overview of what cryonics is about and how it fits into life extension. Cryonics is not something you want to do not something I want to do. It's really a backup option. The goal is perpetual life. The goal is not to die. There's different ways of putting that. I rather like the term super longevity because it sounds kind of like a superpower. Uh, but indefinite lifespan, radical life extension, all the same thing. That's the goal. The goal is not to be put in a tank of liquid nitrogen. Nobody really wants that. We want to avoid that if possible. So take good care of yourself. Uh, get supplements from Bill's company, really good stuff. Exercise, eat well, do everything you can to stay alive. But some of you may not make it. Um, some of you may not make it in time for the effects of Bill's trial, for instance. Something can happen at any time. We don't know how long any of us really have. So cryonics is really life insurance in the truest sense. What they call life insurance is really death insurance. 
but Quarenx really is life insurance. It's a stopgap measure. It's a way of giving you a chance to have more life. So let me just sort of explain the basics to sort of clarify and correct a couple of things in that little animation that you saw there. The way I think of cryonics is it's simply an extension of emergency medicine. People say, well, cryonics, you're freezing dead people. What's the point of that? Well, no, that's actually completely the wrong way to look at it. And in fact, I'm not even comfortable with people saying, OK, you've got three alternatives. You can be cremated, you can be buried, or you can be cryopreserved. I don't that way, like that way of looking at it because that's framing it in the wrong way. It makes it sound like it's a way of disposing of dead people. Uh, just a better way of disposing of them. That's really not the way to look at it. It's an extension of emergency medicine. Essentially, we're taking over when today's medicine gives up, when it reaches its limits. And those limits change over time. Let's step back, to, let's say, 50 years, 60 years. And if we were at an event like this, and we were walking around socializing, and somebody suddenly fell over, and we checked their heartbeat, and they'd stopped breathing, and the heart stopped beating, we would have said, oh, this person's dead. And that would be it. They'd cut them off, and bury them or burn them. Of course, sometimes they made mistakes. As many of you may know, at certain times in history, people got buried and they were still alive and they actually used to build these little signaling devices so you can say, I'm not dead yet, and they would have to dig you back up. So death is not always a very clear line. In fact, it's not a clear line at all. So what we're doing in cryonics, really, we're trying to buy you time. When a doctor comes along and says, I declare you clinically dead, that is a different situation than 50 years ago, because today we would not accept that. We would not say, oh, your heartbeat stopped, goodbye. We're going to pants on you, do CPR, defibrillation, all kinds of things, and in most cases bring you back to life. Your, your vital functions will resume, and there you are. So 50 years ago, when someone was declared dead, were they? Because today we wouldn't consider that to be dead. We consider that to be a person who is dysfunctional and needs some help. Now, okay, maybe they're dead in some kind of minor sense, the sense in which your car dies on the freeway, because uh, your battery's bad. You don't throw away your car, you recharge the battery, you get a new battery. So there might be a sense of dead in which that's realistic. But if by dead we mean irreversibly gone, then you're certainly not at the point that you're declared dead today. So clinical death is really just the point at which a doctor is saying, I've done the best that I can. Something is wrong with you, your heart's bad, you have cancer, something is dysfunctional, and we really can't do any more. I'm going to draw a line here somewhat arbitrarily and declare you dead. Uh, and many times, when they put that label on you, you could actually be revived. And in hospitals, they have what they call a no-code, which means don't try to revive this person. It doesn't mean they couldn't, it's just that really it's rather pointless, because they'll be very uncomfortable and they won't survive much longer. So there's no sharp line here. Almost all of your cells are alive uh, and potentially functional, but some critical thing has gone wrong. So cryonics is simply an extension of emergency medicine in that what we're saying is don't give up on the patient. Medicine is supposed to be conservative, right? It's supposed to conserve people. Well, disposing of people just because you've reached the limits of today's technology is not very conservative. So what we're saying is, give that patient to us at that point. We're going to protect their cells. And I'll describe exactly the procedure in a moment. We're going to protect their cells, and then we're going to plunge them to very cold temperatures while protecting them. And we're going to store them at a temperature, liquid nitrogen temperature, essentially, minus 196 degrees C, or as Americans would prefer, minus 320 Fahrenheit. That is super, super cold. Okay, your ice box is about minus 20 degrees in your fridge. At uh, that temperature, you can keep things good for months, maybe even a year or so. Uh, I know some people keep things in there way too long, but you know, it does have its limits. But at the super cold temperatures we're talking about, there is no biochemical activity whatsoever. And I really mean that. That means that essentially the difference between one day in liquid nitrogen and 100 years is practically zero. There are some very minor little qualifications to that to do with cosmic rays occasionally dislodging molecules, but basically you're going to be just as fresh 100 years or 200 years from now as you would be in one day. It's that cold. So what's the point of that? Well, that means it's buying you time. Again, 50 years ago what we said was dead is no longer what we say dead today. 50 years from now, with advancing and in fact accelerating advances in technology, we'll be able to fix hopefully aging itself. We're going to fix cancer, heart disease, and the aging process. We're going to repair and reverse all kinds of conditions that today seem like they're beyond repair. And the good thing about cryonics, the great thing about cryonics, is that it buys you indefinite amounts of time. You could actually potentially wait a thousand years. I don't think it's going to take anything like that long. And if you ask me how long is it going to take, I can't really answer that, but my best guess is somewhere between 50 and 150 years. But we really don't know. 
Um, it also vary depending on the particular situation and with what kind of technologies we had at the time that you acquire or preserved. But that's the basic idea. So let me run through the procedure a little bit. Stock draws had it pretty much, pretty, pretty close, but uh, it's missing a few steps. First of all, somebody has to make arrangements in advance. Uh, you can't just say, well, you can. You can try to do this. We get calls when someone calls us and say, you know, Uncle Fred died five days ago. Could you cryopreserve him? And almost always the answer is going to be no. I'm sorry, it's too late. We can't do that. We have to have arrangements made in advance. There's various con contracts that have to be signed. You have to show you have informed consent, that you understand the process, that you know what you're doing. You have to make financial arrangements. We cannot have the, the old days, the early days of cryonics, where people were cryopreserved and then relatives were expected to pay year by year by year by year and after a while they get tired of doing that and they stop paying well, what do you do then that's not sustainable so generally what people do most members use life insurance and people think oh cryonics that sounds like a good idea but that's expensive that's got to be for rich people right i mean how much is it well to cryopreserve a whole whole body patient is two hundred thousand dollars or for a neuro patient eighty thousand dollars and i'll explain the neuro option that they had a little joke about um, that might sound like a lot of money but actually most people pay with life insurance and um, as I think uh, Neil said, and I like to put it this way, the actual cost, and it varies obviously depending on age, but if you look at membership dues for the organization and the cost of the life insurance, you put that together, for someone who's not, not too old, someone who's in their 30s to early 40s, that's about the same cost as going to Starbucks once a day and getting a venti latte. Now, if you can afford that, you can afford cryonics. So it's not as expensive as it might seem. Okay, so how does it work? Well, you make those financial arrangements, you make the contractual arrangements, and then if you get ill, it's a very good idea to let us know, uh, and we keep a track of you. And if we know that you're critically ill, which is actually fairly easy to predict if you have cancer, it's more difficult with other kinds of diseases, we will send out a team, a standby team, and just as it sounds, they stand by and they wait, uh, either in the next room of the hospital or very nearby, and monitor the patient. And Currently, because of the way the law is, you cannot start pre-mortem, given today's definition of death. Uh, one day that will probably change, and it certainly be desirable for people with Alzheimer's disease and brain cancer, where you really don't want to wait until the rest of the body gives out. You want to start to keep the, the brain well preserved. But right now, we have to wait until legal death has been declared. Now, in about 80, 85 percent of cases over the last five years, we have been there at the bedside at that point. And so we can begin within seconds of legal death being declared. So this is rather like a case where you're donating an organ, and you want to keep the organ viable and fresh. Uh, so people understand this now in hospitals. They, when they see us and we kind of explain our processes, and they may have seen one of these documentaries, they sort of understand, they get the idea, they know they have to get out of the way and let us move really fast. The, the initial cooling is very critical. The warmer you are, the faster things are going to fall apart. So you, that initial cooling is really critical. So what we do is it's pretty much right uh, what they showed in the animation there. We will move the patient from the hospital bed into an ice bath. We'll cover them in ice, add some water. What it didn't show is we circulate that icy water because that accelerates the cooling. Just dumping ice on someone is not very effective. We also have a face mask that covers the head because we want to cool the brain especially quickly, that being the critical part. That's really where you live, it's upstairs. You can lose other parts of the body, but uh, the brain you can't replace. Um, we're also going to give you a, a, we're going to restart circulation as it correctly showed. In fact, it was a pretty accurate representation of the device. It's essentially a mechanical CPR device. So we're re restarting circulation. We're restarting respiration. That, what he showed was a little out of date. We actually have a more sophisticated respirator device. But we're restarting your breathing. We're restarting the circulation. And we're giving you a series of medications, about 16 or 17 different medications right now. Some of these are to stop the blood from clotting because we want to better circulate all the meds through the body. Some of them are anticoagulants, some are membrane stabilizers, some are antacids. There's a whole range of chemicals that go into that uh, cocktail. And we're researching currently how can we improve that? What can we take out, what can we put in, what we, might be more effective? The idea is that we want to keep your tissues as viable as possible until we get to the next stage of the proceeding. So all this is happening very fast. And uh, to give you an idea of how fast that can happen, if we have a case locally in Scottsdale, Arizona, where Alcor is based, I think the best time we've had is from the time that clinical death was pronounced, including the cooling, administration of medications, restarting your circulation, to arrival at Alcor is about 35 minutes. Now that's actually a lot faster than we need to do because we can't start the next procedure until we've cooled the person down to about 20 degrees C. Because again, that initial cooling is more important than anything. So at that point, 
what we do next actually depends a little bit on whether it's a remote case or a local case. So I'm going to simplify a little bit by assuming this is a, uh, a local case, because it kind of eliminates one step. We will call in one of our contract surgeons, and they will, let's assume you're a whole body patient, you want to keep everything. I'm not, by the way, I'm, I'm a neuro, so I'm going, to, I'm going to be happy to address why on earth would you want to cut your head off, which is actually the wrong way to think about it. You're not cutting your head off, you're cutting your body off, It's because the, the head's the part you're retaining. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that later. But let's assume you're a whole body patient. What we're going to do is the surgeon typically is going to do essentially a median stenotomy, open up the chest, access the major blood vessels of the heart, and then we're going to connect the patient's vascular system to a perfusion device, a pump and a chiller. Essentially, we're going to remove blood and body fluids, not just blood, but interstitial fluids in the cells, gradually over a period of several hours. Because why would we do that? Well, because the body is full of water. And what happens when you go below zero? Well, you get ice crystals forming. Now, that's very bad for the body. It's not as bad as some people would have you believe. There's a common myth that ice forms inside the cells and expands and essentially blows them up. And even people as smart as Michio Kaku should know better uh, perpetuate that myth. You might find his uh, YouTube video, and then you can find my rebuttal of it also. Uh, he didn't really do his research. He kind of repeated that mistake. What actually happens is that the water will leave the cells, it'll dehydrate, and ice will form between the cells. And yes, it will do damage. It will do some damage to the cell membranes, but it won't blow them up. They won't be obliterated. However, that's not desirable to have any ice formation if possible. So we try to minimize that. So what we do is really not freezing, at least if we're successful. What we do is vitrification. Now, what that means is to vitrify something instead of freezing it means that we're introducing a high concentration of the cryoprotectant solution. The cryoprotectant is a kind of a medical grade antifreeze. And we do that very gradually under computer control. We want to gradually ramp up that concentration to minimize any kind of chemical shock to the cells. But at the end of the process, we've removed all those fluids, and your body has this essentially medical grade antifreeze. Only at that point do we go below freezing. So we want to get you down close to freezing as quickly as we can, but only after we finish that perfusion process, which takes several hours, only then will we go below freezing without forming any ice crystals. So the next stage really is to, once we've fully cryoprotected the body, the next stage is to plunge your temperature down as fast as we can to about minus 110 degrees C. It's already very, very cold. And then we're going to slow down and we're going to take a bit more time. We're going to take about one degree per hour to get down to full liquid nitrogen temperature. The reason for that is that you go through a phase transition and you become a true solid. And if you, still, if you cool very rapidly below that temperature, different tissues will contract at different rates and you may get fracturing. Now, that may sound like a really bad thing. And it, you know, it's something we definitely want to avoid. I think it's probably not that big of a deal in the sense that you, know, you can cut your arm and that will heal itself up and in the future we should better repair that kind of fracturing. What's really worrying is the very micro scale damage that, uh, between the connections in the brain that might destroy your memories. That's what I'd be more worried about. But still, we want to avoid fracturing, so we slow way down. So it takes another couple of days to reach that temperature. At that point, um, we're going to put you in a, a dewer. And uh, Doug, can you bring up that picture of the, the dewer in case you haven't seen one of these things? These are not the bottles of scotch. Um, despite the similarity in name. These are essentially 10 feet tall vessels, very much like gigantic thermos bottles, thermos flasks. You've ever had your coffee kept warm or a drink kept cold in these? These have a vacuum layer. These are all custom made. And we, inside there we have, as they correctly showed, four whole body patients. We can also fit five neuro patients in a central column for, for efficiency. And once you're in there, um, we just refill with liquid nitrogen. We top it up once a week. One of the common things people say is, well, what happens if the power goes out? I think, oh, thank you so much. You know, we never thought of that after 43 years. Oh, you're the first person to come up with that idea. Well, the thing is, we really don't use electricity. Yes, we use it for monitoring systems and alarm systems and the air conditioning in the building. But the temperature is simply maintained by liquid nitrogen. It boils off. So you fill it. The patient's encased in an aluminum pod for protection. That's a very good temperature conductor. So even a small line at the bottom would keep it very, very cold at the top, probably about minus 165, plenty cold enough. But in fact, we don't let that happen. That would take several months before it boiled off to that level. And we have seven different liquid nitrogen suppliers in the area. 
If World War III happened and none of them were available, we could actually go out and buy our own small liquid nitrogen plant. It would cost about twice as much, but we could do that. So it's really a very fail-safe fail, fail system in that sense. It doesn't require constant power. Uh, it's, it's a passive system. So uh, that's one of the two things that people know about cryonics that's wrong. The other one, of course, is that Walt Disney was frozen, which is also incorrect. Unfortunately, you really should have been. So that's, that's the basic procedure. Um, we talk a little bit about the, the structure of Alcor as an organization, um, and then you know, I'll see what, what you're interested in. I can talk about the neuro, I can talk about various different aspects. I can talk about you know, how does this fit into other life extension practices, what does it have to do with religion, whatever angle interests you. But I think it's important to describe Alcor as an organization. Alcor was founded back in 1972, so again, we've been around for 43 years. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. This is not a, a business set up to make money. That's one of the favorite parting shots when I have a debate on TV is, I'm sure you'll make lots of money from this. Like that was ever the goal. Uh, I've been a member myself since 1986, when I was uh, just a young lad. And I was never paid for you know, 25 years, and yet I was active. So it's only since I started this job I've been paid. We don't do this for the money. We do this because we want to live. And we have loved ones who are cryopreserved, and we want to see them again. So it's set up as a non-profit. We don't have to worry about shareholders and quarterly profits. We can think for the long term. And so what we do, um, when someone pays for this, whether it's with life insurance or a trust or some other means of payments, usually life insurance, we'll take a big chunk of that money. If, if you're a whole body patient, out of that 200,000, after we've paid for all of these procedures, the surgery, the chemicals, all of that, 115,000 of that 200,000 is left, and we put that into what we call the patient care trust fund. That is a separate fund that I can't touch for other purposes. I can't use it to buy office furniture or uh, to give someone a raise or do anything like that. I can't use it for marketing. I can't use it for anything. It can only be used for patient care. So for replacing these vessels as necessary and buying them uh, for the liquid nitrogen itself, the direct cost of patient care. And that trust fund has its own board, its own set of trustees that manage that money. And two thirds of the people on that trust board have to have relatives who are cryopreserved. So it's not just a matter of them you know, being well-chosen, good-meaning people. They have relatives in there. They want that money to, to be well-managed. And so far, it's actually been managed very well, and it's been growing. And the whole idea of that fund is that we never really draw down the principal. It'll keep growing over time. We just generate enough off that that we pay for the costs of upkeep. And the actual principal itself will never shrink. It should grow over time. And let's say, take a guess that it takes 100 years. Well, what if we can earn 3% return a year over inflation? That would mean that money would double about every 24, 25 years. So in 100 years, that's four doublings. So we've got two, four, eight, 16. That's quite a bit of money. So we should have a lot of funds available in the future for attempting repair and revival of the patient. And the idea is not to bring them back in the state in which they were cryopreserved. We don't want to bring back someone who's sickly and, and unhealthy. We want to bring you back at a time when we can not only fix the problem that kills you in today's sense, but also when we can reverse the aging process and we can bring you back in a healthy, young, vigorous body, the best version of you. Actually, probably better than the best version of you, frankly, because it, you're probably going to fix some things. I mean, goodness sake, when you bring me back, please get rid of my myopia. I don't want to have to wear contact lenses. Please restructure my back a little bit so I don't have back problems. Um, I can't do deadlifts when I'm looking out because my back just will not take that. So I don't mind that those things being fixed. So you may come back slightly better than you were before, and you'll probably be offered a lot of upgrades because I'm sure there'll be all kinds of opportunities for upgrades at that point. They'll probably say, well, we've got these new sensors you might like. Do you want to see an infrared or ultraviolet? Or would you like us to put some little nanobots into your, into your bones that will super strengthen them? So if you, know, if you fall off a mountain, when you're mountain climbing, it's just going to be a minor inconvenience. It's not going to kill you, that kind of thing. We don't really know what kind of possibilities there'll be, but we can be sure there will be some. So Alcor is really structured for the long-term long -term survival, because we don't really know what it's going to take. And probably someone who's cryopreserved plants you know, we they might not be very damn people who are early or we don't even have a day or two days of the clinical death, they're going to be very, very badly damaged. Now, how long is too long? Well, we don't really know the answer to that. That's actually a very difficult problem, a uh, very, very difficult question to answer. I don't think we really have a good answer. But it's a lot more difficult to destroy the information in your cells than you might think. What we want is the connections in the brain to be retained or 
to be able to reconstruct those connections because that's where your memories lie. It's in those physical changes in the brain. It's not, by the way, in the electrical activity of the brain, because some people say, well, what's the point? Once the electrical activity stops, then all your memory's gone, your mind is gone. But we know that's not true. We know that for absolutely sure. Why? Because we have people who go and undergo surgery whose brain activity is completely stopped for hours at a time, and they're brought back, and you know, they know who they are. Everything is still intact. So electrical activity is responsible for short-term memories only. Uh, anything more than a few minutes gets stored in actual physical changes in the, in the brain. And we are not just doing this based on a hope and a faith that there'll be uh, enough left and you'll be irreparable. We have some direct evidence that enough is retained, at least under good conditions. We can look at animal brain tissue that has been vitrified using the same kind of protocol we use now. We can look at that under an electron microscope, and that shows you all the way down to the cellular level. And you can say, hey, look, the membranes are intact. The synapses are, are still connected. It looks pretty good. And you can compare that to an untreated brain, and you see there's a big difference. Now, everything we know about memory is saying that certainly a cryoprotected brain, a vitrified brain, everything is there. Everything is intact. Even one that's actually damaged, got some ice crystal damage, well, that's going to require more advanced technology to fix. It doesn't mean it's irretrievable. I could take a piece of paper. Let's say, I, you know, let's say while Bill was giving his talk, I was writing down some thoughts, and maybe they were kind of embarrassing thoughts, and I didn't want, oh, I don't want anybody else to read this. So I'm going to tear this piece of paper up. I'm going to shred it this way, and I'm going to shred it that way. I've now destroyed that information, right? No. Because the NSA could come along. <laughs> they'd get those little bits of paper. They'd lay them out. They'd scan them. They'd run an algorithm on that, and they'd, they'd find out what I wrote. It's not that easy to destroy information completely. You might think you have. So the same thing with the brain. There might be a lot of damage in that brain, but so long as you know what was there from what remains, even if the membranes are quite disrupted, uh, disrupted and damaged, so long as you put things back where they were, so you haven't stirred things around, you haven't made a big mess of things, uh, you're still recoverable. It's just going to take longer than a brain that's been really well cryoprotected uh, and vitrified. And obviously, the longer that you're in one of these tanks, the more chance there is that something could go wrong, that you know, the organization could fail or sabotage. So you want to be, come back as soon as you can. That's why we try to minimize the damage. And that's one way in which Alcor is, I think, unique. We really do everything we can to minimize the additional damage done by this process. We want to be there at the bedside whenever possible. Uh, we're looking into right now into vital monitoring devices that you could wear on your wrist that will actually, you know, let's say your heart stopped for a minute, it will send out a signal and say, hey, you better get to this person at these GPS coordinates right now. That's something we hope to have actually very soon. It seems like that technology is nearly there. That will be another improvement in our ability to respond. So that's pretty much the core idea. I'll, I'll just uh, say a little bit about maybe the neuro option and then uh, throw it up into questions. So why would you just want to cryopreserve your brain or your head? As I said, that's the option I've chosen. I've had that since I signed up back in 1986. I might change my mind at some point. If we get really good at uh, the, the process, so we do really no damage at all, if it becomes like in the movies where they're on long space voyages and they essentially put you into suspended animation and it's reversible, then I might just keep the whole body. But my basic thought is by the time I need this, unless I go early, I'm going to be in pretty bad shape. My cells are going to be uh, really degraded, they'll be weak and they'll just be flabby and weak and you know, the body's not much good. It's going to have to be completely regenerated anyway. Almost all the actual material will probably have to be replaced. So why drag this old carcass along when what really matters is up here? What matters to me is that I survive my mind, my personality, because that's what I want to survive, and that's in my brain. So that's the, the bit that really matters. In addition to that, my thinking is, well, the kind of technology we'll need to repair things at a cellular level, to have little nano devices go in and make lots of copies and repair each individual cell, that kind of technology is way beyond what we'll need to grow a new body. I mean, we're already starting to grow organs now, or at least uh, early versions of organs. Just from stem cells, they've now been able to grow embryonic uh, mouse kidneys. So it is really not implausible at all today to say to mainstream scientists that within 10 years, maybe, we might be growing human organs. That is something that would seem science fictional not so long ago. So if we can grow organs, well, we should better regenerate bodies. So, but we can members of that choice. We're about 50-50 on that level. So I don't want to go, go on at too much length of what I think you might want to know. I'm going to throw it open to you and uh, invite your questions for further information. Yes, at the back.
Yes, it's not really related to cryonics. Uh, I haven't experienced it. I've, I've seen that. I don't know. I see a lot of uh, testimonials for it. I really don't know whether that's effective, as people say, but I understand what it is. But it really uh, it doesn't actually involve cooling the body down very much. It may feel very chilly, and it may use liquid nitrogen, but you're not actually being dropped below the freezing point internally. So it, it's not really related to what we do. Well, it's interesting that low temperatures are becoming increasingly used medically. And apart from cryonics, uh, obviously we use super low temperatures for preserving embryos and various kinds of tissues. But on a not so cold level, um, cold surgery is becoming more common, where it will lower people's body temperature to slow down metabolism. Now, recently, uh, Dr. Peter Ree at the University of Arizona in Tucson, who came to visit Alcor and was very friendly with us, uh, he's doing studies with uh, Pit uh, Pittsburgh Hospital. And they're taking gunshot wound victims who normally would be inoperable. They would just bleed out too fast. And they're going to take them all the way down to 10 degrees C, which is way below previous cold surgery. And that just about quadruples the amount of time they have to perform the surgery. So people see that happening, and they think, oh, interesting, low temperatures. They see that we're cryopreserving tissues and now moving towards organs. And they start to see that maybe cryonics is not you know, pie in the sky. Maybe this actually has a real physical basis. So anything that uh, involves cold that has positive effects may be helpful. Yeah. You mentioned the legal complications of starting with someone who has not already been declared dead. Have there, has there been any discussion about um, going to a country where maybe that wasn't an issue? If I was facing a terminal illness and wanted to start the process before too much of the damage was done, are, is there any possibility of other avenues to pursue that? I think that's definitely an area that we're going to be investigating more and more. There are some, we've already started looking at that now. I mean, there are places inside this country, in fact, where you can at least take steps in that direction. They may not be quite as easy as, uh, say, in Switzerland, but in Oregon, for instance, uh, you are allowed to choose when you go under certain conditions. You have to have you know, a couple of doctors to certify that you're within six months. And there are various other conditions. The problem is right now, if you want to take advantage of that, you have to establish residency in one of those places, and that's not that easy to do. You know, you have to, if you only have six months left, you may not have the energy to move there and get a driver's license and do all these other things that are required to establish residency. So that's the problem. But I think it'll get easier because more and more states are going to do this. I'm pretty sure this is a movement that's not going to stop. It's kind of like gay marriage. You know, that, once that ball got rolling, it, it's not going to get stopped. Even in uh, Ireland, I just I think it was a couple of days ago, um, in my neighboring country from where I was born, which I saw some opinion polls there, and it sounded like there was no way gay marriage was going to pass, but it did. So these things can spread quite quickly. And I think this idea of you know, death with dignity or choosing when you go, that's going to spread because it's just obviously a humane thing to do. And of course, yes, you have to have certain protections in place. So I think eventually that will be available everywhere, and that will make our job much easier. Now, this is especially critical if you have a brain degenerative condition. If you have Alzheimer's disease or brain cancer, and we've had patients with that, the problem is that your brain may be pretty much gone by the time something else fails, because that's not really what kills you. Uh, something else has to fail. Now, the only way you can legally accelerate the process right now, and here's a real example of this. Our co-founder of our organization, Fred Chamberlain, he, we cryopreserved him was that three years ago now, something like that. And he was living here in Florida, and he knew that he was coming towards the end. And so he relocated to, to Scottsdale. Again, that was not an easy process because he was almost too weak, and they had to change his medications, and he managed to get well enough to get on the plane and arrive there. And then he arrived, he checked into a hospice, and he told them, just dose me up on morphine. And because he had cancer, you can do that. You can basically knock someone out so you have no pain. And then he said, do not give me any food or water, none. And that's called VSED, Voluntary Stopping of Eating and Drinking. And that's not considered suicide. It's not considered uh, an illegal act. You can do that. Uh, just like you can't force um, a prisoner on food strike to eat legally. 
So that's one way of doing it. Now, if you have a condition that's not cancer and doesn't require lots of pain meds, that might be problematic because you might be really uncomfortable doing that. So you, you really want to have a lot of morphine and be knocked unconscious for that. But that's one way of actually choosing you know, to go at a time that's best for your brain rather than waiting until everything else has failed. So you know, I really think that that will be the norm in the future. And in fact, I think cryonics in general will be the norm. Right now, people think of cryonics as this odd thing that only a few people do. But honestly, there'll be a point not too far from now when, you know, in that future, they'll look back on today and they'll say, are these people insane? They took their loved ones and they threw them in the ground to be digested by worms and bacteria, or they shoved them into a giant oven to be incinerated when they could have cryopreserved them. What a crazy, nutty culture that was. Of course they should cryopreserve them. That will become the normal thing. Just as today, we consider it you know, normal to, that women have rights and uh, not enslave certain races. That's kind of normal and duh, well, of course. So right now, that's not the situation, and that's a major obstacle to becoming a member of a cryonics organization, because you're worried about what will my, my husband or wife think, what will my family say, what will my friends say, because it's considered strange. But one day, it'll be strange not to do it. So that's one reason I signed up when I was only 22 years old. It was really a personal statement that this is the thing to do. Wake up, everybody. Yes, we have a question there. To hold a second for that. Why do you have to go to Arizona? Why can't you do it right here in Hollywood? You don't have to go to Arizona. Well, why did he have to get on the plane and go there? You said. Oh, we didn't have to, but it's better. Why did he? It's better to do it locally because that way you're right near the cryonics organization. We can respond very, very quickly. Uh, we can minimize. Well, as I, I mentioned earlier that I was simplifying the process, uh, there's actually a two-step process for someone who's not local. If someone is very far away from Alcor, what we'll do is we send out the standby team that I mentioned, and when the person is declared clinically dead, we'll do a, a full body washout. It's basically what we're doing is replacing the blood with an organ preservation solution, very much like they use for organs for transport. And the idea is to maintain tissue viability, and we'll go through all those procedures that, that were described and you saw in the video, and then we'll get the person over to Alcor, and then we'll do the surgery and the perfusion and the cryoprotection process. But if someone is local, we can skip that first, first step and we can go straight into the cryoprotection phase. So we'll do the, the, we'll do the recirculation, the respiration, the medications. We'll go straight into the surgical process and the cryoprotection. So really, it's better to, if you're able to relocate to Alcor. And in fact, in the last year, we've had our, our record number of cases last year. About half of those were local ones because I think, I think one person actually was already living there. The other one's actually relocated. And that's something we offer, uh, actually incentive, we actually give people up to $10,000 assistance to do that because it's gonna be, uh, it lowers our cost for one thing and it greatly improves outcomes, uh, it reduces the chance of a problem. Uh, you know, you can have all kinds of things can go wrong at a long distance, you can have transport problems, you can have, you know, all kinds of things can go wrong. So try to be near Alcor if you can. But no, you don't have to be there. We have people in other countries. Um, I'm from England, so, you know, when I joined, I realized that Alcohol really wasn't supporting people in other countries very well. Essentially, what happened was they would get straight frozen in no protection of the cells, uh, shipped over on water ice, and then we would uh, put them into long-term storage. That's not very good. That's very below what we should be able to do. So more recently, we've equipped places. We have equipment in London and in Sheffield, and soon we'll have some in Germany. So we'll be pretty much covering Europe, which is nice for those of us who travel in that area, so we don't have to worry so much. We will actually be able to do a field cryoprotection, kind of a simplified version of the procedure we use here. So we'll actually better do that prevention of the ice formation, even overseas. Now, we have done a case. We actually, we have, we actually have personnel in China right now on a case. Um, earlier this year, we did a case in Thailand, which is by far the furthest we've ever sent anybody, and was also our youngest patient ever, uh, a little girl who was less than three years old with a, a brain cancer that was uh, incurable. So you, know, you don't have to be in Arizona, but it's recommended if possible. You said you removed the blood. Let me get the, uh, give up. Let me do this. When you describe the process, you, re you re remove the blood, when you revive them, what do you do? You use a blood substitute, or how do, how do you bring them back? Actually, the same thing already happens now. There are certain surgeries in which they'll remove your blood. Um, Dr. Peter Rhea, as I mentioned, and these uh, trauma victims, they actually do remove the blood, and they replace it, in his case, with a, a modified saline solution. What we're using is actually more advanced than that, because we've done studies, uh, sorted studies back in the 1980s with dogs, where we were able to essentially flush out all their blood, replace it with a, a solution designed to support them, and for four hours or more, keep them at about four, three or four degrees C, and then replace it with their own blood, and rewarm them and, and have them fine. 
So that's really not an issue. That's already done today, actually, in medicine, that you take someone's blood out and can replace it. But you, you're right, it may, it may be something entirely synthetic. It might be something much better than normal human blood. Um, there are already designs now for interesting little things that you can put in your bloodstream. Uh, Robert Freitas, who's a, a brilliant guy who designs nanomedical devices, has described respirocytes, which would be these little uh, nano cages that hold oxygen molecules. And so, for instance, if you had a heart attack and you wouldn't get any blood pumping around, they would automatically start releasing oxygen, so you wouldn't, your cells wouldn't starve of oxygen. Or you could go swimming underwater for 20 minutes without having to breathe. So you, know, you might well get something like that that's uh, better than human blood. But you know, the default would be just to replace it with your own blood that's genetically identical to what you have now. We don't need to because uh, you know, that if we have the ability to re reverse the aging process and repair all these cells, we can certainly produce blood that's compatible with your system. So that's not, we don't need to keep the blood, no. We have a, couple more, a, ch a chance for a couple more questions, Max. And I'll go on as long as you can tolerate me, Neil, as long as you have. So. Uh, a comment and then a question. The comment is, I was thinking of a cheaper way to experience feeling totally frozen to spend some time with my mother-in-law. It really is very effective. The question I have, though, is how much of a problem do you see is recrystallization during the thawing process? Well, we, we don't thaw anybody yet, so uh, it's not a problem today. But that is a problem that will have to be faced in, this, in the future. But that's something that's already being worked on right now by the people who are trying to do organ cryopreservation, organ banking. So there are ways around that, and I'm not a technical expert on how they do that, but uh, that's a problem that's already being solved right now and has already partially been solved. And there will be research presented at our conference in October in Scottsdale uh, with some major advances in that area. So there are things you can do to prevent recrystallization. There's a lot of problems when you restart circulation. Um, you know, people commonly hear that the brain dies after three to five minutes without oxygen. That's not really true. Um, that's only true if you don't do anything to prevent it. Because what happens is you get reperfusion injury, where essentially a whole chemical cascade starts happening, a lot of free radicals are released, and you don't come back from that. But there are ways of protecting against that, in which case you can certainly survive uh, you know, lack of oxygen for longer periods of time. And of course, you've, you've probably heard of cases of people who have drowned in cold water and have been clinically dead for various periods of time. I'm not sure what the record is. There was a Swedish woman who was clinically dead for several hours. I can't remember exactly the exact amount of time, but it was a long time. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was a boy who was clinically dead for over an hour, and that's just from when they, they found him, so they're not really sure how long it was. And these were people who recovered fully. Some of them took a couple of months to get all their function back, but pretty much fully recovered. And they were not even cryoprotected, um, but they did cool down very quickly. And most of these cases involve children because they have a larger uh, surface area to volume ratio, so they cool more quickly. And again, you know, the more quickly you cool, the less damage is happening, less metabolism. So these kind of things also, along with the cold temperature surgery, help people to understand the rationale behind cryonics. One question here, Max. Okay. Yes, sir. Two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, do you think in the future that people uh, would, you know, uh, just say, okay, I got six months to live and kind of make it as an easy way out? Because I know a lot of people who were given six months to live and actually survived, whether it's through um, you know, in IV therapy and other natural procedures rather than what their doctor said. Uh, so, one, do you look at it as almost like a virtually suicide if you just cut yourself off and then freeze yourself? And two, have you, I think you answered my second question already, but you haven't recovered anybody out of the, out of the tube, the chamber? No there's, no, there's no way we're going to recover anybody at this point. We just don't have the technology to reverse, first of all, whatever it was that killed the person in this today's sense of kill. Uh, we don't have the ability to reverse the damage done you know, in the hours after that, we don't have the ability to reverse the damage done by the cryopreservation process itself, uh, damage which we're trying to minimize over time. So there'll be absolutely no point in trying to, to revive somebody right now. And now I've forgotten what your first question was by the time I finished answering the second. Oh, okay. Yeah, I absolutely do not recommend that you uh, try to get yourself cryopreserved just because someone tells you you have six months. No, you want to wait until you really are sure that you know, you're not going to recover. And that can be a hard decision. That can be very hard to know. But no, just because you know, someone has said you have six months, don't do anything drastic. <laughs> because you know, we can't guarantee cryonics will work. I think it will. I'm pretty confident. 
um, throughout a lot of our history, we've kind of really hedged our bets so much and said, well, you know, maybe it's just a tiny chance of it working. No, I think it has actually a very good chance of working. I think the evidence shows that um, we are preserving the structures. It's just unbelievable to think that the technology will not be developed that can repair this kind of damage. It just requires that we don't destroy the planet and we let technological progress continue. We're not violating laws of physics. We're not attempting time travel. Uh, it's just an engineering problem. It's a very complex one, but it's one that essentially is almost inevitable. But you know, there is a degree of uncertainty. The organization, you know, something might go wrong. We might foul up and, and implode. We might be banned for some reason. You know, maybe the government will be taken over by, by you know, some religious fundamentalists who think there's something wrong with it and ban us. I mean, we don't know. Anything could go wrong. So you don't want to be unnecessarily cryopreserved. So I said it's, it's your last option when today's medicine fails you. It's not something you leap into with great enthusiasm. Okay. One more question here, Max. I guess I'm, I'm a little bit interested how this would affect like neuroplasticity in the future. I understand that it would preserve like long-term memories, and obviously learning and memories are um, the consequence of neurons that continue to fire. That's why it wouldn't help, you know, with short-term memories. But do you foresee like any issues with learning in the future because of this? No. If we've re if we've uh, successfully retained the structure or repaired whatever disruption was done to that structure, then you, everything is there, everything is intact. Again, except I say short-term memory, but short-term memory really is very short, it's just minutes. So, you know, But I imagine like learning, like your neural pathways to learning basic tasks, even like for science, people who study science and stuff, I imagine in the future if you're woken up, I, mean, I have to continue to read my biology books to remember, it's not so much a long-term memory, it's a learning process, right. I'm just wondering if it's going to affect learning in the future for these people who are... You know. Well, it definitely affects it in the sense that when you come back, you're going to be able to learn things a lot better because as you get older, it gets harder and harder to learn things because your cells are aging and you know, the neural transmissions are not working as well and your brain generally is just not functioning very well. So when you, we bring you back, we wouldn't bring you back until we have complete control over aging and we can rejuvenate those cells, which includes the brain cells. So you'll actually come back able to learn as well as you ever were. And I'm sure, again, there'll probably be some things where improve your ability memory has it these days, it's a thing to do, who knows, but you'll at least come back with the best brain you ever had, so I wouldn't really worry about that. Actually, one more, Max, I have one more here. And then I have one final yes, thing to say. I was wondering if you're going to establish other, other branches. Uh, other branches in the sense of storage, no, not right now. Uh, we have, as I said, kits around the world. We have, we have kits in Canada and kits in various other countries. So in that sense, we, we work with local groups so that we have kits in place. We don't have to worry about customs, you know, bringing strange chemicals into the country. What, what is this? Uh, we had that worry with China when we just went over there recently. We didn't know if we could get everything across the border. So we try to establish supply depots in a sense and also skilled people in different areas. But we don't really need another location right now. We're not big enough for that. We have 137 patients. And we have room actually in our building to expand to probably easily 1,000 patients. So it will be a while before we have another location. Now, other, other organizations may create alternatives. Um, Bill, for instance, has a project called the Timeship, which is designed to be a very large storage area and a research area. Uh, so that, that may in the future be an option for people. And as we grow, and if we grow faster, then we may indeed have other locations. But right now, uh, we're pretty happy where we are in Arizona. We chose it actually. We were originally in California, and we thought, hmm, earthquakes, probably not, a, probably not the best place. Uh, plus, you know, you're, you're near the ocean, so if, some, if they had a, a tsunami or something, which seems pretty unlikely, but might happen within 100 years, uh, not the best place to be. It's also heavily regulated, so we ended up moving to Arizona because it's very low risk. Essentially, there are no typhoons or tornadoes, and I think a tsunami is not going to make it that far inland. Uh, the earthquake risk is pretty low. It's uh, over 50 years, the risk of having a Anything up to a 5.0 is about 2%. So it's, you know, and we can, we can take that. So it's a pretty safe area. Plus, it might seem weird to be in Arizona where it's hot, but you know, patients can't feel that. They're in liquid nitrogen. It doesn't make any difference. And one reason we chose this area was that although it's a very Republican area, it's kind of a hands-off form of Republicanism. So they don't interfere with us. And we, may, you know, we talk to them beforehand, and we establish relations, and we're on very good terms with them. Uh, when a, a law came up, about 10 years ago now, that would have put us under the regulation of the cemetery board, which causes all kinds of problems. We, we talked to the politicians, we got this, uh, who is now the Secretary of State of Arizona, Michelle Reagan, came to our defense and a number of other people, and we built up some real strong political support. And in fact, and, well, 
I better not say it because it's not confirmed yet, but uh, two very senior politicians will probably open our conference. So we're not considered to be uh, outsiders so much there. We're actually kind of welcome as a symbol of advanced technology. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Max, yeah. please explain to the group, we do have a company called Suspended Animation that has a, a facility in Florida, because I, I don't think people understand. We, we've got that emergency response capability in South Florida right now, in addition to England and, and upcoming in Germany. Right, yeah, good point. So Alcor contracts with another organization called Suspended Animation, um, which is in principle a for-profit company, but actually doesn't make money. It's actually subsidized by Aquionics enthusiasts. Um, and will be, you know, secure funding has been put in place for that to my understanding so it will keep going um, until it can become profitable. But they have a network of people around the country. They don't do other countries right now, so we still do responses in Canada and, and Europe. But they have perfusionists and surgeons and EMTs and nurses uh, in quite a few different locations around the country and a facility, as Bill says, in California where they're doing research and they have their main team. They have a vehicle here in Florida, um, an emergency vehicle where they can actually do the surgery if no other location was suitable. Uh, they have another one in California. So um, you're between us and our partner suspended animation, we can pretty much get anywhere in the country. So you know, we can get a call from, where was it we had last, end of last year, somewhere in the middle of, middle of nowhere pretty much, a very small town in, in the middle of a state where I didn't know we had any members and we got people out there very quickly. So we're kind of a small organization if you look at the number of employees and that's a little bit misleading. There's only eight people on the full-time payroll but we have all these contract surgeons, we have you know, the agreement with suspended animation, they have several dozen people around the country, and we have a lot of advisors and so on. So our actual capability is a lot more than it might seem from the number of staff we have. Just to, um, if we're running out of time, I'd just like to say, if this interests you, if you'd like to investigate a little bit further, but you're not quite ready to take the leap and become a full signed up member, uh, ready to go into action, what you can do is you can come no, this is not the right card. You can come get a card for me for a free associate membership, or you can simply give me your business card, or write on a piece of paper your name and address, and we'll give you one free year of associate membership. Now, that's not full membership. What that means is we'll send you the magazine, which comes out monthly, Cryonics magazine. I think there's some copies um, out in the lobby. That's been going for, for decades now. That keeps you well informed. If you want to come to the conference, it gets you a discount on the conference. And if at some point you decide, yeah, this, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this, then the $10 a month that you would start paying after the first year will be credited towards your sign-up fees. So it's a super inexpensive way of getting in touch. And if in addition you sign this one-page form called the Declaration of Intent to be Cryopreserved, it's going to make it much more likely that if you have a, a crisis, something suddenly goes wrong, and this does happen, believe me, way more often than you like to think, uh, makes it much more likely that we can actually finish getting you signed up because, again, you have to do this in advance generally. We need to show some informed consent. There's not going to be a financial problem for the family and so on, the certain criteria. But if you're in our system, you've already been involved and you have this form, we're still going to have to arrange the funding, but you're a lot closer to be able to do that in an emergency. If you know you're going to go in three or four days, it might happen, whereas otherwise it's not. So if you just give me your contact information and ask for that, I'll give you a free, free year of that associate membership and then you can choose to renew or not, as you like. We out of time, Neil, or any more questions? Max, I want to thank you for the most impressive presentation I have ever seen and comprehensive. Uh, Max covers so many different bases in a relatively short period of time, I can't tell you. I've seen people spend six hours explaining what Max did in about 35 minutes, so I'm very impressed, Max. Thank you. Um, Bill has been a huge supporter of cryonics for decades, so uh, I have to also give him credit for that. Well, I've been a cryopreservation member since around the age of 16. Uh, to me, it always made sense. What I want to conclude with, though, is a very short video on the potential to reverse aging. And that's such a fundamental premise behind the concept of cryopreservation. Because if we can't reverse aging, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for most of us, other than that two-year-old who, who died in Thailand and who was cryopreserved. That would then make sense, even if we could not reverse aging, to be able to bring her back to life. But for most of us, aging is what's going to do us in. And what we're going to show here is just a very brief clip on what I talked about initially, about the parabiosis research, just so everyone fully understands that there is an incredible tsunami of effort in the scientific community right now to reverse human aging. 
And I don't know how much that excites each and every one of you, but for me, it means that we may be very close to not worrying about biological aging in the future. So that's why cryonics becomes so critical. If I do miss the boat, I want to make sure I have the chance to catch it in the future. So Peace. Thanks for sharing that with us, Bill. And um, Dr. Max Moore, thank you for your presentation this evening. We actually have a film. Uh, it's entitled New. We don't have time to show it tonight, but uh, what I'd like to invite you to do is join us downstairs in our social hall. We have some food and some drinks, and you have a chance to meet with and talk directly with Bill and Max, myself and others. If you have any other questions, I saw that there were some, we can perhaps answer those on a one-to-one -one basis. And by all means, contact us by email if we can help you in the future. And we'll be here again next month, where we have another presentation with uh, Jim Stroll and uh, Bernadine from People Unlimited, and that'll be on the fourth Thursday in June. So we'll hopefully see you then. Thank you for coming tonight. It's